Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is a program in which I interview people about legal issues in Vermont. And it's actually now one in a series of interviews that I've done on the subjects of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, we're taping this today, <laughs> uh, and it's amazing. The, my guest is Amy Fitzgerald, whom I have known for many years. Amy's had quite a career. She is now the, let me see if I get this straight, the executive director of the British Columbia Society of Traditional Houses. Did I get that right? Correct. Oh, good. Um, and she deals a lot with people who've had, uh, women who've had trouble with domestic violence. And uh, I really thought it'd be great to talk to her about how she, how they handle this stuff in Canada. And here we are, 3,000 miles apart, and uh, we're, we're giving it a shot. Amy, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate this. It's my pleasure to be here. And thanks to the technology, we can do this. We can do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, how long have you been the executive director of this organization? I have been the executive director of the BC Society of Transition Houses for two years. Oh. Uh, and before that, I was the director of training. Um, oh. So I, I was initially hired to do training for them are, on legal issues are you related still, to family violence. And are you still a member of the bar in Vermont? Uh, I am an active member of the bar in Vermont. I am yeah. not a member of the Law Society here, oh. but I can provide legal training and general legal information to frontline workers, which was my initial job here, and then I became a consultant. What are the goals of your organization? So we are a provincial umbrella organization, so we are not frontline. We are the network um, that supports the frontline uh, programs across British Columbia. So we train, support, advocate on their behalf, um, provide them skill enhancing, uh, promising practices, um, lots of webinars right now, lots of online trainings. So we are the folks behind the frontline folks who are doing the work 24 uh, seven. How many member organizations do you have? So we now have 114 member programs across British Columbia. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. We, the organization has been around since 1978. It started with four women's shelters. Um, here they call women's shelters, transition houses or safe homes. It started with six, and they're the folks who banded together and said, we need to have province-wide voice and province-wide advocacy and training. So they started it back in 1978. So it's been growing since then. And in British Columbia, we have seven regions um, across the province. And so we have houses in, and member programs in every single region. Um, and then we also have a program that's specific to children and youth. It's a specialized counseling service for them for when moms come into shelter, they get specialized psychoeducational counseling and that's called the PEACE program. So we also oversee that portfolio or provide support and training and that's 86 programs and they're nestled in the Women's Transition Housing Supports Program. Do, do you provide legal services to people or? Um, we, there are some transition houses that have legal advocates on staff that are funded um, specifically to address family law matters, and they are funded by the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and um, they, um, so we provide support to them as well, and then we work very closely with um, RISE Women's Legal Center, which is a pro bono legal clinic based here in Vancouver, mm -hmm. but um, is, uh, it's affiliated with the University of British Columbia School of Law. So it, it's, a, it's a working clinic where students come in and, and work there for a year and, in, and are supervised by lawyers. And so they provide um, uh, a family law hotline and um, sort of triage cases. They do um, unbundled uh, summary legal advice uh, virtually, and they also run a virtual legal clinic. And the virtual legal clinic actually predated the pandemic. <laughs> and it was interesting, but it was to reach rural and remote communities where there were no legal resources available. So they, and they're run out of um, transition houses. So the woman would be in the shelter and then have the ability to connect with a lawyer using the technology and the internet that was provided at the shelter. I was recently told that one half of the homicides committed in Vermont last year involved incidences of domestic violence. Is there some overlap here in British Columbia? 
yeah, absolutely. Um, significant number of, of homicides. I would say it's not quite as high as that number here, probably more like 40%, um, but very similar um, circumstances. Um, and also um, a high use of firearms here. Um, although, um, you know, you don't, Canada has more uh, restrictive uh, gun control legislation, but still hom homicides and domestic violence are often committed with um, firearms here as well. Do you, do, do these, do these member organizations handle cases where the children are abused in the home? Yes. So it's, um, it's usually a circumstance where that, that's part of the reason why the, the uh, peace program, which was the children who witnessed abuse program originally, and was recently rebranded um, was created was there that ch children were seen as either direct or indirect victims of the family violence in that setting and when they would come into the um, shelter setting there was a need for a specialized support services for them um, and so that's absolutely you know a, a sort of complementary portfolio that that's that the frontline folks are providing well i i, I always i don't want to be uh... I want to be precise. Are most of the victims you deal with women? Yes, they are. So, and our and our um, our they're self-identified women who who come into the shelters. Um, but yes, and the majority of victims of um, intimate partner violence or domestic violence or family violence is consistently women. Not you know there are there are male um, victims as well, but but the statistics are are in concert with the statistics in. The U.S. Um, that that women are predominantly the victims. Of these like ninety five percent or something like it's that. It's like ninety, yeah, ninety, 90 to ninety five percent, absolutely. So that's the reality, and the reality is the majority of perpetrators are male. I mean, that, that is the reality. So yeah. you know, it, it's um, you know better to acknowledge the reality so that you can address it. And you know, and there are programs that that provide support services for perpetrators as well, um, and particularly those who are pre-charged and looking for support services and looking for sort of the equivalent of like a batter's intervention program. That's a voluntary program. And is that a, a nonprofit of some kind separate from your organization? Yeah, so some of the houses themselves, it, 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 you know, acknowledge that their, their focus, their mission and mandate is support women and children including violence. But they also acknowledge that there's sort of a, a bigger prevention element here that unless you're talking to the perpetrators um, and trying to address some of the underlying um, issues related to their behavior, um, we're just going to be running shelters for the rest of the time. So sort of with the, the thought that we're trying to put ourselves at work, I think there was a, a recognition by some of our houses that they also needed to provide voluntary counseling support services for male, um, uh, you know, that identify themselves as perpetrators. And perpetrators. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just such a daunting task. I, uh, well, it's a daunting task. Um, has the pandemic affected the volume of cases? Yeah, so we, um, our houses, because of the provincial health um, mandates, um, had to reduce their capacity about 50%. Um, because of the physical distancing. So houses that let's say had 10 beds now had five beds. So the capacity was significantly impacted. Oh. Um, what happened here was the- I mean, social distancing in the place? Yeah, social distancing oh. in the place. So, um, so the houses stayed open 24 seven throughout the pandemic and they still are um, providing services. Um, and um, for circumstances where you, are at capacity or over capacity, um, their main funding source is, is a provincial organization called BC Housing. They provided them additional overflow capacity at hotels. Um, so, so they had the ability to still provide the same amount of supports and, and to the same amount of people, um, but it was just in a different, uh, oftentimes in a different site, which was, which was a challenge because part of the transition house sector and the women's shelter sector is it's a communal congregate setting and a lot of it the healing goes on in that house setting and there's so a victim shared, victims support each other and that kind of thing yeah there's a shared kitchen there's a shared living room there's a shared oh. play space 
Um, so it's very much a community. So that got fractured and also everyone had to wear masks and right. sanitize. Some houses, in fact, for preventative measures, um, opted to wear um, gowns, hospital gowns, the staff, because they would you know, come on site, change into that and sort of in concert with the women living at the house so everybody knew and and to be honest initially it was a hard transition but then the women realized that they were doing it to keep themselves safe and to keep everybody safe so um and so yeah so it definitely impacted the practice and we've had lots of webinars about sort of looking at other jurisdictions in terms of how they address some of these issues um lots to learn um and it's we're still in a situation where all these mandates are still in place um, and Canada is actually behind the United States in terms of the vaccination rollout so we will be in this situation for a longer period of time probably than hopefully. Mm. Well I just uh, I, I've always thought how, how difficult it is for the children in these situations. Yeah it's very difficult yeah and also and there, we had to sort of come up with what happens when children go to school and then they come back from school and then you know they've got a they're you know you, you know all these sort of restrictions on their bubble and who they're interacting with and so many elaborate systems were put in place that that were sort of on top of the elaborate systems that were already in place to keep women and children safe so um yeah and this portfolio on average serves about twelve thousand women and children a year um, so lots of folks coming in and out of the doors of these programs. 12,000 cases? Yeah. And do the, some of these services involve uh, people take going to court with the victim? or? Yeah, so they do provide court support work um, and workers. But, you know, it's just a transition out to a worker or a support worker, but it also is now a court worker. <laughs> they do many things at the transition houses. They provide, you know, they look for housing with them. They provide employment. You know, assistance um, and help. But yes, they do provide um, court uh, support and um, they would go to court with them to assist them with the applying for a protection order or to be a witness, um, you know, sort of a, a, a friendly witness or friendly helper at a court proceeding in a family court matter. All of our family court proceedings right now are, are virtual. So wow. it's been unusual, mm -hmm. right? A little yeah. bit unusual circumstance. Find ourselves in. Um, yeah. I, I'm just, I just feel sorry about that. I, I think it's, it's so important to, there's so much more communication than just a spoken word. You know, the, the way the nonverbal communication is often very important in judging the credibility of a witness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's really, to be honest, it's, it's an access to justice issue here um, because of the fact that women don't have the technology oftentimes to even engage with the courts. They're, they're using, Microsoft Teams to do it. So, you know, that requires you to have a Microsoft Teams account. <laughs> so that's where the transition houses come in because they're able to at least provide that technical um, support. Well, a, a woman can go to the transition house if she has to to use. Yeah, to use interact with the courts. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So it's, yeah. And there's also here in, in British Columbia, as in the United States, there's a, there's a lack of um, lawyers um, in family court matters, so um, particular, and um, about 45% of women in family court matters are going uh, self-represented. So huge issues in terms of, you know, again- 45% of the women represent themselves? Correct. Yeah. Do they get, do they, are they told what to, what to, what to produce or, I mean, yeah, when they're working with the Rise Women's Legal Center, yes, <laughs> but they don't, they don't have a huge budget, but, uh, but no, there's very little, uh, there's some guidance from the courts, but not, there's no, they don't have court navigators, they have court clerks that they rely on, um, and those, you know, those, they're busy people. And, um, but yeah, so there's a significant, I would say, access to justice issue, and they also had cuts to legal services um recently so that um has created even more strain on women the legal services is a government funded uh, operation it's, it's a it's a province um provincially funded um corporation yes and they had cuts to the um their legal services supports um 
Was so, that because of a lack of revenue to pay for it? Was lack of revenue, and then and then interestingly, the legal services shifted to a lot of online um, resources, which is good. But in some circumstances, we argue that um, for for domestic violence or family violence, it's much. It's great to know that information, but you really need a lawyer or or a legal advocate walking alongside you to have it be a meaningful sure. process. Sure. Wow. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Do you, do you have um, mental illness problems with the people who come in? Are they depressed or they're? Yeah. Do you, do you provide services to people like that? Yeah, many of the women who come in, um, they bring very complex needs with them um, that includes mental health and substance use issues. Um, and so um, we have a training program that we run. Um, it's called Reducing Barriers, and it's to train transition houses um, to, to basically meet women where they're at in terms of their mental health and substance use needs. Um, some of our houses um, practice significant harm reduction and are low barrier and, um, and have a, you know, a variety of practices where they're supporting women um, in terms of even using on site, to be honest all the way to other um, houses who don't practice that, but are still trying to meet women where they're at, still trying to provide services um, to them and to get um, complementary support services for them in the community. So um, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And it's actually one of the biggest issues right now that we're seeing is the complex needs of the women and also the children and youth that are coming in. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of trauma in their background and, and a lot of um, you know, violence. And as a result, many of them um, have history um, associated with substance use or mental illness. And, and some of it is coping mechanisms, right? That's how they've been coping through years, so. Yeah, well, I, 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 <clears throat> in my 15 years on the bench, I read a lot of pre-sentence reports. And often they, you could just see this stem from a, a very violent childhood. Yeah, where, where, the, where the victim became a perpetrator. Exactly. And, and you see that the same pattern here for certain. Um, and in the children and youth in particular, you know, that's that you have sort of a moment in time, right? That you try, you, you know, that you just want to have some immediate services to meet their needs for that reason too. So that, that, so that they don't have that trajectory, right, going forward. Um, but yeah, so it, it's definitely a huge issue. And also the other thing in British Columbia is that we have a, we have a second public health emergency, which is an opioid crisis here to the point where um, last year we had in British Columbia, we had 1800 folks die of opioid overdoses. And so to put that in context, we've had um, a thousand people die from the pandemic, from COVID-19. So we have more people dying of opioid overdoses than we do from the pandemic. So we have sort of parallel public health emergencies running at the same time, and, they, and, the, and the opioid um, addictions impact our portfolio. Um, well, what's the population of British Columbia? There's 5.1 million folks living in British Columbia. Um, and then we're located in Vancouver, met, you know, the lower mainland metro metropolitan area, and that's about 675,000 folks right here. So that's sort of like Vermont. And how many people died of opioid overdoses in the last year? We had, it was eight, approximately 1,800. So it was, a, and from eight, the year... 1,800. It was more than... Homicides, car crashes, you know, combined, and it was it was an increase from 2019 of 80 percent or something like 79 percent. So it's a huge issue here, huge issue. In fact, they're they're struggling with it and trying to. There's talk of trying to decriminalize small, um, like you know, doses of um, for use for personal use, and they're trying to get um, the the. The province of British Columbia has approached the federal government to try and get an exemption to allow for that because it's under the it's under the criminal code, which is federal. Um, so sort of yeah. So so we've got and we do have um, sadly um, overdoses occurring in our 
shelters and in their houses. In your shelters? Yes. So well, we've had a little over 100 uh, opioid deaths here, and we're very concerned about it in Vermont, of course. Yeah, no, yeah. it's terrible. Yeah, so we actually just came out with another, with a set of overdose guidelines um, for our, for our, the member programs. Um, and so we distributed those, and then we're gonna be doing a webinar um, with about the overdose guidelines that we put together. And we're gonna bring in some frontline folks who are doing harm reduction in this portfolio. Just and you're doing that for all the membership organizations and their employees? Yeah, so we'll be doing that in March, um, yeah. So, um, and and a lot of the training that we used to do was in-person training. We used to go out into community and train, which was really fun, lots of fun, road trips to rural and remote communities, lots of fun. You learn more than, than you probably give to them, <laughs> those trainings I found at least, right? Yes. Learn about the communities, but now it's all shifted to remote. Uh, and virtual, which is actually, you know, to be quite honest, the silver lining is it's very accessible for folks and everything can be recorded. And so, so there's some positives to this strange world we're finding ourselves in. I've always known you to be honest. It's, you know, <laughs> I, I understand, thank you. <laughs> do, you um, do, 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 do victims have, have the option of getting a protection order? Yeah. Can they go to court and get an order that they can't be abused by this person? Yeah, they have, um, there's a, it's, it's, it's under the Family Law Act here, um, and it is a, it's a civil order, but if it's um, violated, then it becomes a criminal sanction, um, similar to the Vermont um, yeah. order. Um, and uh, they also have things called peace bonds here, which are sort of old fashioned common law remedies to keep the peace um, that you can get by just going to um, law enforcement and law enforcement puts together the application and then um, and uh, brings it to the court and advocates on your behalf. Um, and, and some communities find peace bonds um, just as effective as the protection orders and easier to get. Interesting. Who, who, is there an attorney who does this? Is the police do this or? Well, the peace bond, it's a police officer. You can apply directly to the court on your own as a pro se litigant, or you can go to the um, local law enforcement and they put it together. And it's and it and it can apply to all. It, it can apply to family members, but it can also apply to uh, non-family members. So um, so it's it's an interesting practice, to be quite honest. Um, do you and, think it's Do you think it's a good idea? Well. It's, it's interesting. When I first started doing the legal training here, I was focused on the protection order because that's what I knew from Vermont, right? And right. all the ways that once you get the protection order, you have to ensure that it, you know, it, 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 people know about it and it's served yeah. and um, and that it's enforced by law enforcement. And then um, and then other frontline folks came to me and said, "No, we use peace bonds. We find them more accessible, easier to get. Um, there's more familiarity with them by the courts." So it's an all, so basically when we train, we train both. We say in some circumstances, maybe that's the route to go and other circumstances is the route to go. Um, but with all orders, as you well know, Ben, it's all about the enforcement, right? And it's all about the, the, the response if there is um, a violation of the order in terms of if there's an immediate response for it to really mean something. Well, I think that's one of the things that's lost when this is all done virtually. Yeah. I think if, a, if there's a perpetrator stands up in court and you look them in the eye and say, you don't want to see me again, I think they understand that. Yeah. And I don't have to go into great detail when I warn them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I would, yeah. So that they're very similar protections as, as in Vermont, um, but they're only as good as folks, you know, follow them or enforce them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm running up to the end of my 30 minutes. This has been great. I want to thank you again. If you get the yen to do this again, let me know. And I'll, yeah. try, I'll try to set it up. I and, would love to do this again. And I'd be happy to also bring in some of my other colleagues doing really interesting work to talk about this stuff too. So no, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great yeah. idea. We've got I've got a tech safety um I'm sorry. It's technology safety. It's about how women can use uh, oh. technology in a safe way and also how a technology is being used to perpetrate violence against women. So so she's so happy to happy to introduce you. 
We might be able to do 30 minutes on that. Easily. Oh, it's great. Amy, regards. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, yeah lovely to see you. I hope that you'll come back to Vermont when the uh, plague is finished. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to traveling to Vermont when this is all over. Yeah, it's lovely to see you, Bennett. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in the islands. Yeah, yeah. Best regards. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.